Hello, and welcome to Cyberdeck Users Weekly, a bi-weekly podcast about how to own technology. I'm Paul Miller, and I'm really honored to be joined today by the town mayor of St. Ives, Jonathan Pallant. Welcome, Hello. Jonathan. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> uh, we were talking about this a little bit, but I just think it's, it's so cool. You know, I was following you. I, I, uh, I saw you give some talks at REST conferences about this Monotron project and, you know, um, embedded hardware and all this stuff. And I was like, well, I'm going to follow this guy on Twitter. And it's like, mayor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you come for the so, rush, you stay for the, uh, yeah, traditional twee English politics. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, and, and uh, can you just give a, a, a bit of background of like outside of your mayoral duties, uh, w- what do you do day to day? So my day job is um, an embedded systems engineer. I think that's a label I've yeah um, pretty comprehensively used over the last twenty years. And I'm currently at uh, Forty Two Technology. They're a product design firm based in St Ives. Basically, people come to us with the difficult problems, um, and then we solve them. You know, and uh, and I love that because it's it's something different. You know, every every couple of weeks there's new projects coming along, completely different areas, be it sort of industrial or consumer goods. But being an embedded engineer, it comes down to the same kinds of problems. We need to get some data out of some system, transform it in some way, and ship it off somewhere else so the product can do what it is it needs to do. Yeah, what 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 it would be an example problem if there's something that you can talk about that maybe it's not confidential or whatever that's a really good question because yeah a lot of the projects we do are are confidential obviously um i can talk about yeah some of the things we have in our back catalog which will serve as a as a good example um there is uh, a product um designed at 42 technology which you install into a um a mains electricity substation. So as you know, you, your main network grid is going to run at you know 132 kilovolts, I think it is in the UK, and then that gets stepped down at a series of transformers before you know in this in in the UK we get 240 volts at the outlet. So there are there are some substations. There's sort of little um, wooden shacks and brick buildings dotted around that transform down the the 11 kilovolts to the to the the next stage. And we designed a system where you can pull out the the fuseways, um, so these huge fuses that used to, you know, they'll blow if there's a, an overcurrent on that particular circuit. You could pull those out, insert our monitoring system, and then put the fuses back in over the top. So it only takes a couple of minutes to install. But what it is basically is an electric meter for your substation. I'm told that what they have at the moment is a maximum demand indicator, which is like an analog dial that somebody goes to the substation like every six months and looks at it and goes, huh, that many kilowatts. And then they reset it back to zero. And you know, that that that's all they've got. So we designed this system to go, yeah, no, you can we can do better than that. We can give you, you know, real-time demand monitoring on all the phases in your substation, voltage phase and current. So you have a much better idea of, of what's happening at the at the edges of your network grid. So that's an example of um, one of our engineers came up with a the specific piece of technology. Because obviously it's it's quite difficult if you're trying to measure the voltage and current when you're operating at 11 kilovolts. You have some fairly interesting uh, isolation and safety issues if you then you know want to put that data onto an SD card that someone can just pull out of the slot when they when they go and visit the substation. So yeah, one of our engineers had a came up with a the novel idea of how you could do the opto isolation and how you could how you could get the um, get these readings on a system that was really super simple to, to retrofit. And yeah, we sort of work that up into, into this product. So yeah, there's, there's one example of something we've done in the past. And then where's the, where's the computer in that? The, the SD card, like the, there's readings and then those get recorded and then they're stored and like, you know, like where, where, where are you coming into that? Right, so the, in that system, we've got um, a microprocessor on each phase. So there's three phases. And that microprocessor is, you know, for all intents and purposes, is running at 11 kilovolts um, relative to Earth. We then have a, an opto isolator system, and then we can run um, data down the fuseway um, 
into a collection unit which sits at the bottom and that unit collects the data from all three phases um, and you can imagine that's a, a microcontroller with a screen and an SD card and then you have interesting conversation with clients about um, you know how you're going to upload this data to the cloud because driving out and collecting SD cards is you know not what you want to be doing and then we can get into all kinds of interesting discussions about radio technology and 2G circuits being switched off and and you know replacement 4G narrowband systems not quite being ready to roll and yeah lots of interesting stuff there. Yeah. Well, I, I I only ask because uh, well one that's fascinating and, and wild and I'm only catching about half of I don't know what it means to be 11 kilovolts to ground but specifically, <laughs> um, but like you know I feel like it's pretty easy to visualize what a um, a web developer does. And it's pretty easy to get into, you know, you, you clone this repo, you installed Node.js, you know, you, you add these 700, um, NPM packages <laughs> automatically with a package JSON, you know, and now you're, you know, you're, you're kind of in the thick of it. Um, and there's something that is a little, uh, the old magic or arcane seeming about in, embedded technology and, and the, 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 surface area between software and hardware and i I think old is the uh, is the operative word so yeah i've been doing this for i was at university 2000 2004 and when you built for embedded systems back then there was still a smattering of pascal and modular 2 but basically it was c and there's probably some kind of make based build system and back then we were probably using gcc and it until um, until the some fairly recent developments, it felt like nothing had really changed. People were still writing C code, you know, the old fashioned way. It's sort of like um, artisan handcrafted source code. You know, they're doing it the hard way. They don't really have any tools to help them. You know, this is this is writing out books with a with a quill and ink rather than using a printing press. It's, I'm going to start with a, a blank text file. I'm going to write out my C code. I'm going to compile it, produce my object code and, you know, get it f- programmed into, into my microcontrollers. Um, and it, it was, there's a certain sense of disfatis- dissatisfaction with that, certainly from my point of view, thinking there, there has got to be a better way to, to do software um, than, you know, they're doing it this way. It does work. People have been doing it for a very long time. But yeah, when you look at the web developers and you look at the the nice tools they have for, you know, for debugging and deployment and continuous integration and unit tests and all that stuff. And I was left thinking, well, how do I get some of that as a, as an embedded engineer, which is then, you know, how I stumbled into the, into the Rust programming language. Yeah. Which is obviously how I first saw you. So I, 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 I mean, I'm obviously going to link this in the show notes. You've done several talks on the monotron, um, mm-hmm. and I uh, I don't know how to explain why it's so enjoyable to watch. But for me, it's like it's like you're watching a, a Apple keynote. You're unveiling these features like it's 80 megahertz, so you don't think it's going to be able to do anything, but it does video and it does sound and <laughs> there's text on the screen, and you know I'm, I'm applauding personally. So yeah, can you? you explain a bit of this this monotron and now uh, neotron project yeah sure the uh, the monotron um, yeah was the sort of the my original rust project so I came to rust in oh goodness yes yeah, probably going on for about five years now I was just looking up earlier when rust 1.0 came out um, which yeah was apparently May 2015 so I came into rust um, a few revisions in so for those of you who aren't aware, this is a, a sort of a modern replacement for C, and it um, they do a release every six weeks. So they've gone from 1.0 to 1.0, uh, what are we up to now, 43 or something? So 43 point releases um, over, you know, not not many years. Um, so, yeah, so I came to it in 2015, and I I was dabbling around. I think I wrote a web server in about a week flat, and I was like, okay, yeah, you, can, you could be pretty productive with this. I like this. And I wanted to... I wanted to revisit. Um, I wanted to revisit my childhood. I wanted to go back to the to the nineteen eighties. Uh, maybe I was just sort of un, unhappy at work, and the job I had 
back then and you know things were kind of difficult so it's like you know what i just want to go back to when i was a kid and computers were simple and i'm going to build myself a really simple computer it's been done loads of times before there's loads of other you know great prior art in this space but i said the thing i'm going to do differently is i'm going to see how much i can do in rust and i don't imagine i can get very much of it done because this is kind of a new programming language and i picked a random developer kit that I happen to have on my desk that I've been using for some robotic stuff previously. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's a Texas Instruments Cortex M4. Um, it has no video support, no audio support. It is utterly unsuited to being used as a computer. But I think that's what made it interesting. You know, I can pick up an STM32 with you know, full graphics display that'll run, you know, the kind of touchscreen you'll get on a state-of-the-art um, microwave oven or, um, you know, any kind of commercial goods with sort of a four-inch screen. Those kind of microcontrollers, they do video. That's a well-solved problem. Um, that was less interesting to me. It was taking something wildly inappropriate and saying, how far can I push this? When am I going to When am I gonna run out of things I can do? And, do, do, yeah, do I haven't have a, really run out yet. <laughs> Do you have a sense? Could you compare it to um, like a Commodore sixty four or, or you know, one of those old old timey computers uh, yeah, as far as specs, like the actual power that you're dealing with? That's yeah, that's probably a good kind of um, good kind of benchmark. So, that, what makes this interesting is if you go back to something like uh, a Commodore sixty four or certainly an Amiga, um, those kind of machines, they had a lot of custom silicon that was specifically designed to help developers write the kind of games they had back in the day. So you have hardware sprites. You can tell the hardware, take this 16 by 16 pixel Mario or Sonic or whatever the character is and place it at this position on the screen and you give me an interrupt if he if the character bumps into, you know, a bullet or a, you know, some kind of bad guy on on the screen. So you have hardware that can do that. So the Commodore 64 is an 8-bit processor. It's a, a variant of the 6502 uh, running at 1 megahertz. But because you've got this video hardware, you can actually do a quite a lot, um, even though it takes you know a microsecond to do each clock cycle. What I've got with this Cortex-M4 is kind of the opposite. I've got 80 megahertz, but I've got basically no hardware support. So to draw the video, the processor is having to um, calculate the uh, pixel that needs to be displayed, uh, do the color conversions or whatever, and push that push those pixels out to the monitor in real time. I don't even have enough RAM in this computer to store all of the pixels you see on screen at once. So the pixels are calculated one by one in turn at the, the frequency the monitor demands them, and that is... 20 megahertz. I have to produce 20 million pixels per second. So I get four clock cycles to calculate each pixel, whether that's, you know, a picture or a piece of text and apply the background color and all that kind of stuff. So by the time you've spent 95% of your CPU time drawing the screen and getting all these pixels pushed out, um, what you're left with is sort of, yeah, broadly mid 80s home computer kind of performance so yeah commodore 64 zx spectrum yeah around that around that kind of around that kind of um specification and for a long time that was enough i i am often dismayed at software on my desktop machine getting bigger and bigger and it mm -hmm. takes longer to update and it's sort of this big tower of complexity that no one really understands. And when stuff goes wrong, you just sort of shrug and go, eh, I don't know, well, maybe we just reformat and start again and see what happens next time. I Commodore 64 crashed. I just turned it off and turned it on again, and it was fine. And I understand there's, you know, some of the complexity is, is necessary. I'm not completely naive. I understand, you know, if you're gonna connect systems together, You've got to be pretty on top of it from a from a security point of view, but I don't know. Maybe I'm just old fashioned. You know, I'm getting old now. I'm getting into my middle ages, so I just 
yeah, yearn for those simpler times where, yeah, if it goes wrong, just switch it off, switch it on again. And uh, it, I want a system that I can, it's small enough basically for one person to hold in their head at once. No, you know, no, no one can tell me that they can hold, um, you know, this Dell laptop I have in front of me, the entirety of it in their head at once. You know, Windows 10, they got, you know, 3D graphics processor, um, you know, audio acceleration, USB, NVMe flash. I mean, it would, you'd struggle for one person to understand the flash controller, never mind everything else that's, that's going on in this system at once. You know, and in some ways that that marks out progress. That's what humanity does. They build on on what came in the past. But I think it's also nice to remind ourselves of what we used to we used to be able to we used to be able to do with with far fewer resources. Well, yeah, I mean, you're speaking so much that's resonating with me here, and, and yeah, I, I I'm sure that there's just this these maybe rose colored glasses I have for older technology, um, and I and I always try to remind myself of how often my Mac used to crash and how how I yeah. lose work and how frustrating you know it would have hard freezes very frequently, which are much le- less common nowadays. But like like you said, it's so hard to hold a whole system in your head in your head, or even just the flash controller uh, design in your head. That um, it's kind of hard to know which are the good abstractions. Like which which ones are we um, you know stand on the shoulders of giants, and which ones are we like building you know a fort in quicksand? You know. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and it, and it is difficult to to try and pick out you know, the the good from the bad. And I think that's why it's interesting to go back to a basically a clean sheet of paper um, and say, okay, how did they do these things in the past and why don't we do them that way anymore? And, you know, there's quite a few things I've looked up and gone, yeesh, yeah, okay, no, I understand. I understand why we don't do that anymore. You know, if you go back and look at uh, programming on MS-DOS systems and having segmented memory, um, and the difference between near and far pointers, you know, that's a, that's just a whole horror story. I'm very glad to to leave in the past. So yeah, my system is definitely flat, 32 bit linear memory address space, just way simpler that way. But equally, you know, it is possible to do something, you know, interesting and entertaining and useful in 32k of RAM. You know, I've got a uh, BBC Micro, the machine from Acorn that was basically um, used in every school in in the UK during the 1980s. It's got 32k of RAM. There's an awful lot you can you can do with that system in terms of uh, education and you know storing information and retrieving information. It's a small amount of RAM, but you can do a lot with it. And yeah, you do look at some. You do look at some of the sort of electron-based apps you download at the moment, or some of the development environments for some embedded chips. I downloaded one for a, a microchip pick the other day, and it was something like a seven gigabyte installer. And I think they bundle their own copy of Java and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I'm just like, I, I am not convinced that this is this is the future I want want to live in. That's that's a lot of data by by anyone's uh, anyone's standard. Well, there's also there's also a lot of um, expediency. The bloated way is usually the quicker path. I find um, you know Electron um, seems like it's the easiest way, especially if you already have a web app. It's the quickest path to the to getting a a desktop app. To, to your customers and so that that's your priority so you just go for it mm. and and the casualty is ram usage um it, it how do you decide i mean like you, you decided obviously with the monotron you had your hardware so you knew that whatever you're going to accomplish is going to fit inside of this hardware but like when you have maybe a more unbounded problem how do you decide what is worth the effort to truly make this efficient and and minimal in the correct way versus just like you know i'll, I'll throw mm. a few libraries in here that are solving my problem for me and the user can can buy another sticker ram yeah it's, it's um it's an issue so to, to, to be very clear i 
I hold absolutely nothing against people who develop apps in Electron because clearly it is the the fastest, you know, easiest way to develop a desktop application. There's a reason people are using these tools. I think my my gripe is with, you know, the the operating system developers um, who allowed us to get to the situation where that is the best solution um, in in so many metrics. You, know, you go back to the early versions of Windows. The whole idea of Windows was to save disk space. Why did you need a bunch of printer drivers shipping with your copy of WordPerfect and then also a bunch of printer drivers shipping with your copy of CA SuperCalc, the spreadsheet, and then also a bunch of printer drivers shipping with your copy of AutoCAD for DOS. Why don't we sort of wrap this stuff all together and make these reusable components that applications can rely on? So we now get into you know Windows 3.1, and I just have a printer driver installed on my system, and all of my applications can use it. And I have a library containing common controls like an open dialog box and a print dialog box and toolbars and menus. And my applications now can become smaller because they just call out to these pre-existing uh, pieces of, of functionality. And then somewhere on the, on the road in sort of the intervening, what is it now, 30 years, we seem to have gotten to the point where we ship these enormous operating systems to users' desktops and then application developers don't seem to want to use anything that the operating system shipped with. They want mm -hmm. to use their own JavaScript runtime because, you know, I guess the there isn't one in the OS or the one in the OS is no good. They want to use uh, JavaScript because it's cross-platform and the operating system vendors don't seem to have any interest in helping you do native cross-platform apps. You know, it's incredibly difficult to write an app and then compile it for Windows, and then compile it for Mac OS, and then compile it for, for Linux as well, because they want to keep you in their own sort of proprietary um, sort of fiefdoms. You know, they, they want to keep you in, in this area. And I, yeah, I understand that, you know, uh, Linux and the, the free software movement takes a different approach to that. But still, if you go, for example, I'm going to write a, a native application, I'm going to compile it for my system, and I'm going to use GTK, well, that's not a library that, that comes with Windows. So now I have to bundle, you know, GTK and the text internationalization, and then you end up with Pango and Cairo and all this other stuff I've seen come along. When you install what, you know, what should be a small application, but the operating system doesn't include any of the bits I need to make it work, which is why you end up with, you know, seven gigabyte installers, I guess. Um, well, I think it's so interesting. I think it was I forget specifically. I think it might have been Jonathan Blow on the on the Metal podcast. We were we were talking about this before. Mm. We're both great fans of this podcast. Um, uh, I think it was on on the podcast where he was saying, you know, we have these operating systems that ostensibly um, abstract over the hardware. You know, you write software one time, um, and and then the operating system can run that software on multiple different pieces of hardware. But now you have uh, you have one GPU. You have a hard, you have a, a laptop, and if you install, um, you know, Mac OS on that laptop, you talk to the graphics card via Metal, and if you s install Windows, you talk to that graphics card using DirectX uh, or Vulkan, and on Linux, you can talk to it with you know Vulkan or OpenGL or whatever. Like it's like the 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 abstraction has become the anti abstraction somehow. Yeah, and I I don't know what the what the answer to that is, but it's it's something that that troubles me, and I guess it's where it's where some of the the new developments in the operating system space um, kind of interest me more than sort of I get the the traditional desktop. So I have a lot of respect for the work that Google engineers are doing on Fuchsia. So this sort of came out as a as a sort of a secret thing, but it wasn't secret because they were doing it in public, but they sort of shipped it out under the radar and no one was really sure what it was, but it's starting to pretty much look like an Android replacement written from the, the ground up with a, a C++ microkernel and much better isolation for the, for the hardware. And I have a lot of respect for the engineers who are working on uh, 
Redox. It's either Redox or Redox. I don't think I've seen a. I don't think I've listened to a presentation where someone said that out loud. I've only ever read about it. But that's a, a, I'm pretty sure it's Redox. I had Jeremy Solar on on uh, this podcast. Oh, yeah, I'm cool. a huge huge fan. So uh, yeah, the work they're doing there again, another microkernel sort of clean. It it feels like these are better solutions than the sort of the the legacy support piled upon legacy support that we that we sort of have to suffer with today. My my go to example are for Windows. Um, I think I ran this experiment maybe ten years ago, but I don't imagine it's gotten a lot better. If anything, it's probably got worse. And that is, I fired up. I fired up. Um, it would have been Windows Seven, I think, and I fired up ten different applications from Microsoft. Um, you know, there were some Office applications. There was Skype, Notepad, Explorer, um, Internet Explorer, Visual Studio, a whole bunch of different stuff. Every single application I loaded had an entirely different user interface in terms of the menu, the toolbar, the scroll bars. Every single one was different because some of them were written in .NET and some of them were written in Microsoft Foundation classes and some of them were written sort of using older APIs or you know that's whatever was was in vogue at the time that particular application was made and now nobody wants to to get rid of it. You know, we went through this phase of hiding all the window decorations and sort of drawing your own close and minimize icons and your own title bar. So you sort of tell Windows to hide the title bar. Don't worry, I'm going to do that myself. And it's like, why? We had a perfectly consistent model for moving around these sort of window abstractions, making them bigger, making them smaller. And yes, uh, the buttons are different on Mac OS to the R in Linux than they are on Windows. But at least we sort of broadly understood this one makes it bigger. This one makes it go away. I drag here to move it. And someone to somewhere decides to hell with that. I need to differentiate my application by making it vastly less usable and much bigger than it otherwise needs to be because now I'm shipping all these bitmaps and this rendering code to replicate something the operating system was doing perfectly adequately already. So now I'm feeling like the the villain because I just man I've been a huge sucker for for borderless windows. <laughs> <laughs> I think Electron it's one it's one line to remove the title bar, right. and then you're off to the races. And, yep. and then yeah, and then fifty lines to replicate a subset of its functionality. Um, yeah, I think that's interesting. You know, it's it it's, Microsoft's in this weird spot. Um, where they really, it seems like they don't even have a blessed API right now for actually making native apps. I think they are, I mean, the, my favorite app that Microsoft makes is an Electron app of VS Code. But um, right. yeah, they, they kind of, they went through that transition period where like, well, everything's going touch and we also want our apps to work on a phone and on an Xbox. So mm. you know, we're going to kind of reinvent everything. And then now they've kind of retreated from that. Yeah, And of course, be before spot. that, they, they did try and, uh, sell the world on .NET, and I, I have a, I have a lot of time for you know garbage collected managed runtimes. I, you know, did quite a bit of Java programming at university, and that kind of model makes a lot of sense. It makes a whole load of, um, you know, classic C and C plus plus problems go away. But what Microsoft failed to do, and I would, I would love to dig more into the sort of the internal politics of how this happened. They just seem to fail to bring themselves along for the ride never mind convincing anyone else it's the future you know i i didn't see microsoft office getting rewritten in .NET or at least having a a user interface that looks like it was written in windows presentation foundation they just they produced all this stuff and then didn't use it themselves so i you know from that point of view i guess it's not really any surprise that you know no one else could agree on what to do either um i i think they are doing Better, so I do want to shout out to the to the Windows terminal. I think finally uh, yeah. a console application on Windows 10 where I can zoom the text in and out and support you know my funky powerline fonts and tabs. Uh, they had to do a lot of a lot of internal replumbing to basically make it work more like Unix with pseudo terminals and anti codes. Mm. But yeah, a lot of respect to them for doing that. I am baffled as to why it's written in C plus plus, but. You know, that's probably a discussion for another time. Um, and yeah, I, I like 
what they're doing with uh, with Winget as well. And you know, they're doing all this development in in GitHub and they're doing it in the open. This is, you know, if, if I go back 20 years and I tell myself at university, hey, 2020 is going to be wild for a whole bunch of reasons, but what's really going to bake your noodle is that Microsoft are developing open source software in public um, and, you know, and, and it's going to be good stuff. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, Microsoft are going to ship a Linux kernel with their latest version of Windows 10. I would, I would just <laughs> roll over laughing. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta give, give, give them some credit. I'm still, I still want like a formal apology for the whole <laughs> uh, like patent thing, like trying to destroy yeah. like, the ransom type patent thing, and like yeah, if, getting- if Satya could just apologize for Steve, that'd be great, and then we can all just move on. Yeah, I, I and I'm a, I'm a forgiver. I'll forgive. I just, you know, I want some acknowledgement of past wrongdoing. But yeah, man, I, I do, I do use a lot of Microsoft stuff these days. Um, well, so a, a little bit back to the monotron and neotron because it's really interesting. So let's say you don't have, you don't have .NET. You know, how are you going to get anything done? I don't know. But uh, like, how how far can can you get? And can you imagine um, something like like in, in this demo? You know, if you got text on the screen. Uh, you can have user applications. Um, you have a synthesizer for it. Um, could you imagine some something like this with maybe slightly beefier hardware uh, that you know sends a text message? Like like how how far or or is this is all about exploring kind of the the the, the not the retro aesthetic but the retro way of doing things in some way? I think. Um... I think I'm sort of taking this in two different directions simultaneously. So, so yeah, so as you've alluded to, the, the Monotron project, um, we sort of drew a line under that. I, I took that to uh, Rustfest in Paris. I took that to Rust Belt Rust, uh, which was in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, that, was, that was a great weekend I had out there. And then I took it to the big Rust Conf in um, – uh, that was in Portland – um yeah we did that last year and at that point i thought okay you know it, it it's when a um you know stand up comedian you know they've they've done their set they've done the tour and then finally it's been on tv and at that point they go okay i'm just going to have to retire this because i can't keep talking about the same stuff we'll go and write some some new material so that's sort mm-hmm. of where i got with the with the monotron but i didn't want to i didn't want to lose it completely i was i was unhappy with a couple of things about the form factor um but also I wanted to to delve a little more into into the operating system design. So go, going back to the the design of uh, Microsoft DOS and the the abstraction, the BIOS, this universal abstraction that made all of these incredibly different machines all look and feel the same thing. And basically the same operating system ran and it didn't matter whether your computer was made by, you know, Amstrad or IBM or Compaq, um, you, you had this this um, universal abstraction, a kind of by accident because it was only because someone reverse engineered IBM's implementation. I don't think it was ever designed to be universal, but it worked. So we're going back into the design it, of the. It, it, so, I'm sorry, but it, it, correct me if I'm wrong. That's sort of kind of the first time you had a universal abstraction like that in computing, right? It's definitely one of the earlier examples. So I'm thinking about machines like the the MSX, and that there that probably postdates the PC compatibles. I think, um, yeah. Prior to that, your your level of abstraction was the programming language. So you had the the Holy Trinity from what is it, 1978? You had the the Trash 80. I'm really sorry to any fans of the the TRS, but it is. As a Commodore fanboy, wow. to me it is forever the Trash Eighty, the Hurtful. Commodore, the Commodore Pet, and the uh, and the Apple II. And I, I guess your sort of cross-platform abstraction there was basic. You know, they all mm. ran variations of um, of Microsoft Basic or something similar. So that's that's what you had. Um, but yeah, the, the, I think MS DOS was a was a great example of taking the power of an abstraction underneath you, and then um completely destroying that abstraction above you to give you a complete monopoly um 
you know, you, you can get into the into the long grass about all the things they did with uh, with DR DOS and and the other various alternatives in DOS. But it, it is interesting to go back to to Microsoft DOS and the BIOS. It is interesting to go back to CPM. I've got a, a couple of CPM machines sat behind me as I sit in my little home office, um, just to try and understand how they did things. How do you sort of universalize accessing a sector on a on a disk when that disk could be a floppy disk? Or a hard disk, or or whatever. And so, what I've what I've done is I've created this project, which I called Neotron. Interestingly, Monotron was only ever called Monotron because I could only get this CPU to emit one color channel. I could only get it to do green on black effectively um, because I didn't at the time I couldn't find the CPU performance to do three channels. What I ended up with was sort of a fringed mess of colors where the colors basically went out of sync as it went across the scan line. So that's where the name Monotron originally came from. Um, mono because it was black and white or green and white and Tron just because that's a really cool suffix to add to the end of any project. Absolutely. As, I, as I've since found out, owning a, a Gigatron, which is the um, which is the TTL computer made out of 7.4 series logic chips. And there's a, I think Monotron is actually the name of a Korg synthesizer product. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff. But we went, okay, um, there was someone I bumped into at the um, oxidized rust conference in Berlin. Um, her name's Segfault, and we got talking, and we went, "Okay, well, let's let's start a new project. We'll take what we've done with the Monotron, and we'll produce um, which we'll produce a family of computers. So we're sort of be trying to like the 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 Commodore, but maybe without the appalling business decisions. I don't know. Maybe we will have all the same appalling business decisions." <laughs> um, but so the idea is you can, I've got to write this BIOS, which has this universal abstraction that you should be able to apply to pretty much any microcontroller you can target Rust at. And then there will be an operating system image, a bit like Microsoft DOS, which should be broadly the same. And in an ideal world, it would be exactly the same, but you can just flash into the top part of the, the flash ROM on any of these boards, whether it's uh, an STM32, or it's a Texas Instruments, or it's um, you know a Silicon Labs, whatever it is. If it if it runs Cortex M instructions, you should be able to flash this same operating system in and get all the all the functionality. So all the BIOS has to serve up is key presses, some way to access video RAM, um, yeah, control access to sectors on a on a disk, assuming you just have some linear set of sectors because there's a piece of history we can thankfully forget about cylinders heads and sectors as a method of addressing magnetic media what an absolute nightmare it is so much simpler if we just say okay sectors are 512 bytes and they start at number zero and we go up until we run out of disk space um which is exactly how a, how an sd card works so yeah take a make an interface so we can access sectors on our disk um, an interface for writing samples to the to the audio buffer, maybe um, get the synthesizer to play some tones, um, or maybe actually the synthesizer will be will be part of the operating system. Maybe that's something we can just have that's common across all the systems. I don't think any of these chips I'm targeting have a hardware audio synthesizer on board, so you know we can probably push that into the operating system. So yeah, it's it's revisiting these ideas of operating system design. It's continuing to push the boundaries of what can be done in Rust. Because ordinarily with Rust, everything is statically linked. If a compiler has some function in um, crate A that's calling some function in crate B, the compiler pretty much always has the source code for both of these at the same time. And you need this to resolve um, problems around generics. If the function I'm calling is typed on some type T, well, I need to know what the T is in this particular instance. Is it an integer? Is it a you know, a string, what is T? And to do that, I, I basically need the source code for the crate I'm calling um, when I compile my, my first crate. If you have a BIOS in the bottom half of your flash ROM and then a generic operating system image that could have been compiled, you know, some months earlier on an entirely different version of the Rust compiler, you now have some interesting challenges in how you describe an interface in ways that are stable 
across um, across versions of the Rust compiler. The compiler, for example, is perfectly free to reorder everything in a in a structure. It might decide that you know because it's a Tuesday, actually, it's better if we put these items first and these items down at the end. I can't have that if I want a sort of fixed, stable ABI that um, that's gonna gonna last. So, yeah, it's been it's been interesting to dive into the the operating system and the BIOS and the abstractions. And I'm currently working on a a BIOS ROM for something that's basically a monotron, but in a uh, a slightly better form factor. So we call that the Neotron 32. We've still got the MIDI ports. We've still got the VGA. We've still got the PS2. Uh, I've added a reset switch. I've got one uh, just in front of me here. Uh, we've got two uh, Atari joystick ports, SD card slot. It, it's basically what we had before, but it's a, uh, I've gone up to a four-layer PCB. The other excuse for doing this is just I get to practice using KiCad. So the thing is, as a software engineer, you can get pigeonholed, and they don't necessarily give you the electronic design work. You get the boards that are finished. So I'm hoping oh. by practicing my KiCad on the side, building some four-layer boards, getting them shipped in from JLC. Um, yeah, I can sort of continue to straddle that electronic software fuzzy line and and make some more decisions about what should be software and what should be hardware. Uh, yeah, so that's that one. Maybe yeah, you could describe, help describe that a little bit because I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, of people who haven't experienced this. Um, I've, I've looked into it a little bit. I've never ordered my own uh, PCB. But like... Uh, it sounds like there there are a lot of democratizing forces where you know, yeah, it's a little more expensive to get started, but you know you can you can literally clone a repo and um, uh, you know off of GitHub and then you know like I'll get I'll get I'll get this manufactured or I'll I'll add my name to it and then I'll get it manufactured you know and then you ship it off somewhere and somebody prints you know a, a motherboard basically for you that you know. Uh, now it's, it does whatever you wanted it to do. I don't know. Maybe you could describe that process a little bit. And if, if you see that opening up or becoming easier, because theoretically it sounds really cool that I could print my own computer, you know, or, or I, I buy the little system on a chip that's much too complicated for me to have manufactured, um, but that I socket that into a, a host um, board that, that does the things that I need it to do. Hmm. So I, to, to put this in some kind of context, let's go back to the 1980s and talk about what it was like to make a circuit board. And what it was totally. like was pretty horrific. You Your circuit board is, you know, as it was then, it's um, inert material. Um, uh, these days is a material they call FR4 with a layer of copper on top. And your job as a, as a circuit board designer is to work out which pieces of this copper sheet should stay behind and which pieces of this copper sheet should go away, and then we drill some holes through the board so I can put the legs of legs of my components through. And that's basically the job of of electronic circuit design, as as I see it. So back in the nineteen eighties, I'd I'd get my board and I'd order it, and it would have the the sheet of copper on top, and I now need to get rid of some of this copper. And the the most common approach, certainly the one I I was using when I was at school, so this would have been sort of. Uh, yeah, maybe as late as 93, 94, something like that. You would design your your circuit by hand, didn't have uh, EDA tools then. I would get it printed onto a sheet of A4 paper, or I might just draw it, um, yeah, I'd, I'd draw it out onto a, a sheet of A4 paper. I'd get that photocopied onto a clear acetate sheet. These are the sheets they used on, on overhead projectors for you know, it's sort of like an analog PowerPoint. You'd print it onto a clear plastic sheet, shine a light through it, and big stuff would appear on the wall. Um, you'd get that onto onto the clear sheet. So I now have black ink everywhere I want my copper to remain. I would cover my board in some kind of horrible substance which reacts to ultraviolet light. I then shine an ultraviolet light through the picture of my circuit. And I basically, I'm making the, the material... Uh, hard. So when I, I shine the ultraviolet light on it, I, I sort of harden up the material and then it goes in this big bath of acid. And what happens is all of the all of the copper I don't want uh, gets eaten away and all the copper I do want gets left behind. I, I probably misremembered this because it was a long time ago, but that's basically the process. Create an image, shine it on, UV light, terrible chemicals, horrible acid, have to jiggle the board around in the acid to make sure it's sort of happens uniform the whole thing absolutely stinks um 
I'm very glad we don't have to do that anymore because now <laughs> I can I can do it all in KiCad. I click a couple of buttons and it goes to a factory somewhere. And yes, you can get it. You can get it done in China in Shenzhen, and that's by far the the cheapest way to to get it done. But you're probably going to wait, you know, two or three weeks for the for the boards to come back, you know, the long way round. Or you can get it done locally. You know, there's there's great firms in the US like Osh Park, and there's loads of firms in in Europe as well. If you want to pay a bit more, you can have the boards done more quickly. But basically, I click 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 with my mouse. Yeah, or I download a pre existing project, move some stuff around with open source software that I don't have to pay for. Um, you know, it's all it's all free and open. I I send off the files. They show me a real time uh, view of my circuit board on their website, so I can look at it and see that they've correctly interpreted my files. And I do have the copper where I want it to be, and I don't have the copper where I don't want it to be. They can print onto the board. It's called silk screen because I guess in the olden days it used to be squeegeeing some white ink through a, a screen made of silk. But basically, they print. Uh, words in white onto the PCB for me, so I can label where all of my connectors go and the you know the values of all the resistors. And then you know I just drum my fingers for a couple of weeks and PCBs turn up. And you know I've I've made a computer. I could never have made anything of this complexity back in the back in the nineteen eighties. Even a, even if I was you know this age, because it's a four layer PCB. This is basically four separate PCBs sandwiched together that stuff i was doing in the in the acid etch tank was was one-sided you didn't even do both sides of the board because you'd never get the two sides to line up um you know mm. you're sort of drilling through with a with a manual drill so it is incredible what you can get done at at a very low price point and the way they do it of course is it's completely automated their computer collects the designs from you know a dozen different people arranges them all on one panel which is probably you know Something like half a meter by half a meter, pretty pretty big kind of panel. It runs through the machine fully automatically. It does all the etching. It can do all the drilling. It can do all the printing, and then it comes back and it goes to a to a human who looks at it and goes, "Okay, yep, there's the twelve designs. I've got three copies of each of them. Just pop, pop, pop. Press them out. Stick them in a box and and ship them. And so when you when you reduce the labor involved to you know very little." That's where you can you can get the price down. So as an example, this this PCB I have in front of me, this is probably uh, well, I know it's it's about a 140 millimeters by 160 millimeters. So what's that going to be? That's going to be about sort of five inches by six inches, something like that. And I got five of these PCBs made, and it cost me 50 pounds with postage. And actually, a third of that was postage. You know, the boards Beautiful. themselves cost very little. Um, and, and then some of these system on a chips are, are pretty because this this like this is a board that hosts the the um, the microcontroller or whatever it's right. called. The... Yeah. So the 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 idea with the monotron and the 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 neotron thirty two as it's now called is you get um uh, an evaluation kit for the particular system on chip I'm using. Um, the evaluation kit costs about ten or fifteen bucks. It comes with a debugger and USB connections. And these chips have got like 0.5 millimeter pitch spacing on the leads. And I'm never going to be able to solder stuff at 0.5 millimeter. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm fairly messy when it comes to the through hole stuff. And soldering is definitely not my strong point. But this really fine surface mount stuff, you know, I can't do it. You know, this capacitor's on, on this board made by TI. If I was laying them down, you know, you just breathe too hard and the capacitors have all disappeared off into your carpet. Um, so yeah, the idea is you you get this board from TI where they've done the hard stuff, and then the rest of it is just big chunky 1980s style parts, chips with big fat legs, um, you know, components with pins on. But what's really exciting, so what I've been able to do with the the sort of the, the newer version of the the Neotron is if you look at something like um, an STM32, they have a they have literally hundreds of of CPUs in in their range over at, at ST Micro. But if you take one of their Embedded microcontrollers. This is a microcontroller designed for, you know, a home appliance, as I said, you know, maybe a four inch LCD on it. It's one of those chips that I sort of frowned upon previously because it, it had video built in. And so that felt like cheating. But actually, mm -hmm. where I'm sort of pushing the envelope now is you get one of these chips, it comes with a CPU that runs at 
480 megahertz. In terms of performance, and I've checked the benchmarks, it's broadly the same as a Raspberry Pi 1 because the Raspberry Pi is actually a much older design of ARM chip, and so it cannot get as much done per clock cycle. So at 480 megahertz, we're about the same speed as an original Raspberry Pi. We've got a megabyte of SRAM. We have hardware uh, video output, so I no longer have to spend 95% of my CPU time painstakingly drawing pixels. I just have a big block of silicon that's just gonna push those pixels out for me. I just set some bytes in RAM, and pictures will appear on the screen. I've got Ethernet, I've got digital audio in and out, I've got high speed uh, 480 megabit per second USB, I've got high speed SD card. Um, you know, on so this is, as best as I can tell, this is about the speed of a mid 90s PC. You know, this is sort of Pentium 100 level performance. And I can get this chip for $10. <laughs> And then it doesn't, it only has one megabyte of RAM, which is a lot of RAM for an embedded system, you know, to drive your washing machine or something. That's a lot. But uh, you can get a little external uh, memory chip that uses um, a serial interface. So in the olden days, your memory chips had, had uh, maybe 40 or 50 or 60 pins. And that's a lot of PCB you have to design to get all those wired up, make sure all the traces are the correct length. You could get now get serial um, SRAMs which are pretty high performance, and they have eight pins. So now my board is much simpler to design. I could put that down, that's eight megabytes of RAM. So I could build a system, it's about the speed of a Pentium 100, it's got eight megabytes of RAM. I am fairly certain, I haven't done it yet, so don't quote me on it, but I'm fairly certain I can get this computer to run Doom and maybe run Quake, because there are source ports of those and I could compile them for ARM. And that's on a chip that costs $10. And the amazing thing is some of the services, the PCB manufacturing services in China have said, well, we're running the, the boards through the machine and the machine next to it fits surface mount parts. So if you order your PCBs from us for no extra money, we will run them through the surface mount pick and place machine. As long as you buy all of your parts from us. So I buy the $10 CPU and I buy a bunch of capacitors at cost, you know, half a penny each or whatever. Um, they won't fit the big chunky components, but that's fine because I can do that. So it's now getting to the stage where for only, you know, maybe the same price as a Neotron with the PCB from Texas Instruments, I can get JLC to make me a PCB that's the same size that has this monster of an STM32 microcontroller on it. It's basically with, a supercomputer. It, 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 in an embedded world, it is. It is basically an Amiga 500 or, you know, uh, maybe in an Amiga 1200 or, a, yeah, you know, a Pentium 100 kind of PC. It's that sort of early to mid 90s computer that I can make for myself, completely bespoke to my own design, you know, not the silicon, obviously the silicon just, just comes as it is, but I can lay the board out to my heart's content, click a few buttons and they'll arrive in the post two weeks later. And it's really not more expensive than, than what I was doing with the, with the Monotron. And that I find incredibly powerful because let's not forget that, you know, your Dell laptop, even your, your Commodore Amiga back in the day, you didn't own that. You had, you had no say over how that was laid out, how it was designed. Maybe you wanted three joystick ports instead of two joystick ports. Tough. Sucks to be you. You get what you're given. You know, this is a very large number of people doing their day jobs to, to churn out this product. But now it's the case that, you know, this is one of the upsides of being able to stand on the shoulders of giants. I can use great open source tools. I can use these PCB manufacturing services. I can look at other people's designs and schematics and I can build a computer. And this isn't just sort of ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64 kind of chunky graphics. Isn't this a bit of a laugh kind of computer? This is, I mean, to all intents and purposes, a computer. I could do, you know, quite a lot of my day job on it. I'm pretty sure in eight meg of RAM, you could go and get, you know, an early DOS web browser to run on it. You certainly could make um, encrypted HTTP connections over ethernet or Wi-Fi 
because it's got hardware accelerated crypto. I can connect to Twitter. I could connect to Slack, you know, anything like that. There's a whole bunch of stuff I can now do on a machine where I own everything, you know, soup to nuts, as they say, start to finish the, the BIOS, the operating system, the PCB layout, um, everything. I own it and it's mine and I can do with it what I want. And I know exactly what's in it, provided you trust the silicon manufacturer. Sure. But at least you designed it so you can, you, you might be, you might catch if there's a, a weird looking thing <laughs> added on somewhere. Yeah. I, I just, there's just something so powerful and so interesting about that. And it seems like obviously most of us aren't going to design our own computers and have them manufactured. But there is something that I just find so compelling about the uh, relative simplicity of that. And like, like instead of trying to simplify the complicated things that already exist, like kind of starting, you know, making a new, a, a new tower of Babel or, you know, a, a mm. new uh, venture into the complexity with a, a kind of a new chance to get everything right or wrong. It's just really interesting. I mean, I want, I want a phone out of this. Like, hmm. like I want to, yeah, I want to text people and, you know, maybe have my Bitcoin wallet on there or something like that, you know, and, but. And actually that, that should be perfectly achievable. This, this processor is, is, you know, it's probably the match for the, the CPU I had in my, my Nokia N900. So when I had that about 10 years ago, I guess, um, you know, there's definitely a lot you should be able to do with a, a $10 CPU and, and $1 of RAM. And, I, you know, the, the Raspberry Pi has always been a benchmark for me because I'm, I'm based just outside of Cambridge and, you know, that's a, that's a home computer for me. And they always reference things I'm familiar with, like the Acorn when they were designing it. But the, the thing that um, has always been slightly problematic with the Raspberry Pi, and it's not to take anything away from what they've done because I absolutely understand the series of decisions they had to make to get to where they are. But what you've got with the, with certainly the earlier versions of the Raspberry Pi is you've got a very powerful piece of silicon that is almost entirely not ARM processor. What it is is a massively powerful uh, video DSP that was originally designed to do um, the world's first video phone for Orange, and then later was the, the video DSP that added video to the video iPod. So when those chunky iPods came out and could finally play videos, it was the video core chip, uh, an earlier version of the one in the Raspberry Pi that put video in the in the iPod. But the problem with that is the ARM is the piece you get to program. And the ARM on that first Raspberry Pi was basically thrown in as an afterthought because they had a small piece of space left on the silicon. They went, well, what fits in a couple of square millimeters? Well, we'll throw in a, an ARM 11. <laughs> and it's actually mostly graphics processor. And for lots of reasons that I fully understand, but at the same time, don't particularly like, you don't get to play with the graphics processor. That's kind of on the wrong side of the walled garden. So what you get is the small piece in the corner and there's a huge amount of stuff going on that you can't play with. Ooh. And they've spent you know, the last five or six years trying to unpick that and giving more and more back to the user. But... Um, yeah, I think it is possible to to do more if if openness is your primary goal as opposed to ease of use and price. And on those two metrics, you know, they absolutely smashed it out of the park. Well, I think there's something really interesting about that story because it, it's something, I mean, you even mentioned like the Commodore 64. It sounds like almost had hardware accelerator, you know, application specific hardware for mm. collision detection, basically. Yeah, yeah, um, it did. And and you know you've you've gone through this journey of you know eighty megahertz is is, is enough for me and I'll use I'll spend ninety five percent of it um, you know building the video buffer or, or whatever whatever you're doing there but um, you know now you're enjoying the luxury of having something that does that for you you know and I, I'm seeing a lot of evolution in you know like the famous example is the the pixel phones with ve they have very dedicated hardware for image processing and that seems to be google's big competitive ad advantage mm. um you know famously in bitcoin uh you know they they decided they only needed one algorithm to go really really fast so <laughs> there are asics that do sha 256 just 
just insanely rapid rates. And so there's, it, it's interesting to me to see if the future of performance gains and, and usability improvements um, are, is more in the side of uh, application-specific chips um, or if, if, if there can be winds going you know, in your 80 megahertz direction where, you know what, this CPU is powerful enough and because it makes it conceptually so simple, I want to do things in sort of this brute force way. I think this is going to be one of those one of those tails that basically ends up in a system that oscillates. Mm. So you get uh, you get the the CPU performance, and people do things in software, and then they go, okay, so now we know what we want to do. There are these very specific algorithms that we can accelerate. Yeah, you, know, you mentioned the the SHA two fifty six or you know the the video, and so we push those into fixed function application specific integrated circuits. We might prototype them via FPGA first. That's sort of the stepping stone. And then, you know, we take advantage of the performance and then new things come along and we go, oh, actually, we don't want SHA-256 anymore. We want um, SHA-3 or PEBCAC or whatever it's called. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, it's not PEBCAC. That's problem exists between keyboard and chair. It's uh, the, whatever the name is for the SHA-3. I know algorithm. there is a hot, a hot new hashing algorithm that yeah. is all the rage these days. So what happens is all of your fixed function silicon suddenly looks old hat. Hey, your GPU only does OpenGL 1.2, and we all want OpenGL 1.4 because you know the water looks more shiny or whatever it is they they've changed. And so you have to bring all that stuff back onto the onto the CPU, and you know you take advantage of the of the new features and the new ways of doing things. And then we once we've worked out what it is we want to do, we then sort of cycle back to the to the integrated circuit. So I can as as long as the 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 integrated circuit manufacturers can continue to to push the boundaries in terms of you know how many transistors they can get onto a square inch of silicon and i'm aware they're sort of running into the laws of physics when it comes to clock speeds simply because it's taking you know significant amounts of time now for the speed of light to carry signals from one side of the chip to the other but you know Instead, they went for multi-core. So now you can buy a, you know, a sixty-four core CPU for, you know, what is not unreasonable money given what, you know, Sun Microsystems would have charged you for that, you know, not very long ago. Um, yeah. So huge respect for what the what the integrated circuit people are doing, and I guess people like me, we just we're following the trends, but I'm thirty years behind the curve because I'm just a guy sat in his office noodling around in the in the evenings um you know for something to do rather than being you know a big office block in westchester like commodore were with you know hundreds of uh, hundreds of design engineers so i guess you know we can we can thank progress for for that at least so what what used to take 100 people you know i can now do on a in an afternoon on my uh, on my laptop well, that's uh, that's beautifully put, and um, I if if you if you still have time, uh, we're we're coming up on it. But uh, I had to, I, I did this uh, on a different episode, um, this segment called "Explain Yourself." So I just they, I had some tweets um, of yours that I, okay. did, <laughs> I, I had a little trouble following. Um, you're obviously hugely into old computers, and you you're kind of. I would say collecting them, sort of rehabilitating them. It seems like. Yeah, yeah. I started off watching people on YouTube do it, and then you know you got to get a piece of that action for yourself. So yeah, there's <laughs> there's a, there's quite a collection behind me. So with that context, um, woohoo! Uh, this is a tweet. Woohoo! Made my EME two three two into drive B, so I can boot from the GoTech, but still read three inch discs. Uh, then you at ZX Spect ROM. This has been so much fun. Smiley face. Um, and then yeah, you have an old PCW9512 boot CP slash M V2.5, 2.15 showing two disk drives detected. So <laughs> what is what is happening here? Well, so we're to explain this story, um, we're going to have to go back to the, the TV show The Apprentice. I understand you have The Apprentice in the, in the U.S., um, yes, I can't. I can't remember what happened to the host. I'm sure he's disappeared. 
in the UK, where it was hosted by a, a gentleman called Alan Sugar. He's he's now a member of our of our House of Lords, so he is Lord Sugar. But back in the 80s, he sold incredibly cheap hi-fis and then muscled in on the incredibly cheap computer market. And one of his, um, you know, um, very well-selling products was a, a machine which is a word processor. That is its job in life. It doesn't really do anything else. You can load other programs on it, but no, this was a machine that was designed to be a word processor. You could put it in the office and replace all those typewriters, and it didn't cost an awful lot more than a typewriter, and you could type letters and documents, and you know you could backspace out and erase things without using whiteout or tipex or whatever it is, um, and you could produce you know quality um, documentation, letters, reports, and whatever. Um, and this machine had uh, a Z80 processor, Z80, where I come from, um, which was getting pretty long in the tooth at this point, and it ran the CPM operating system. So this was what was around before Microsoft DOS, and it was getting a bit old hat in sort of 81 when the IBM PC came out, which is why they went for sort of MS-DOS instead. And the, this word processor from, from Amstrad came out in, I think, late 80s. So it was pretty old technology at this point, but that made it super cheap. It was only a few hundred pounds with the printer and the screen and the keyboard. So I have one of these because my parents had one when I was a kid. And uh, ZX Spect Rom is a friend of mine on on Twitter. He has his own uh, Z80 CPU uh, kit computer. You can buy the parts and build that, but using an original um, Z80 CPU. So he sold me this this Amstrad, and uh, the floppy drive didn't work. And the thing about this floppy drive is, as I said, um, Alan Sugar wanted to build computers that were super cheap, so he used a type of floppy drive that's basically never seen anywhere else. You yeah, have, I've never heard of three inch. Yeah, so you have the three and a half inch um, micro diskette. You have the five and a quarter inch. Well, this is a three inch drive. It takes three inch disks. They've got a hard shell, um, even more solid than a than a three and a half inch. A three and a half inch has got a bit of give in it. These like make a make a tap when you tap them on the desk. They are very solid. Um, they store either um, 180K per side, you have to flip them over, or 720K for the for the high-density version. And that's what this machine has got. Now, because these drives were only ever used in these Amstrads and a couple of models of Spectrum, they are very rare. I can't just go and get an off-the-shelf part to replace it. And they generally wear out and all the discs are worn out. And you could buy a pack of 10 discs on eBay and it would probably cost you something like 25 pounds. You know, the media is is getting very rare because it just expires. Um, so what I wanted to do was put one of these floppy drive replacements. The unit is known as the GoTech. It replaces any standard floppy drive. Fortunately, while these drives look weird on the outside, at the back, they just mostly look like a, a standard IBM PC floppy drive from an electrical point of view. So I... Took one of these uh, GoTech units, I uh, botched up the interface so it would f fit into the Amstrad, and I mounted it in the side of the computer because I didn't want to spoil the aesthetic on the front. And I could I could unplug the Amstrad's built-in drive and boot off the GoTech, and I can boot the machine, and that's great. But what I can't do is boot off my few remaining mechanical floppy disks that do still work because I've had to unplug the drive. Um, I could make the mechanical drive drive A, the primary drive, the boot drive, and I can reconfigure my GoTek as the secondary drive B, and that's okay, except I now can't boot off the GoTek. And I've got a couple of games and a few other things I've rescued off floppy disk that I do like to use on the machine um, that are on USB stick, so I need to be able to boot um, from the GoTek. I don't have an awful lot that I need to boot from floppy, um, and actually, I can just copy the floppies onto the USB stick anyway and, and boot them that way. So the trick was disassemble this quite rare and fairly precarious three-inch floppy drive, of which there's not a lot of information online, reverse engineer the PCB um, layout by taking photographs of the, the PCB and identifying the chips, working out which signal on the ribbon selects drive A as opposed to drive B, actually on the ribbon, they're known as drive naught and drive one. It's an operating system thing to call them A and B. Um, work out where it was, uh, 
I, th- I was going to make a modification to the PCB, but in the end, I found a way to make the modification to the cable. So you've got this 26-way ribbon cable, and I managed to cut out two of the wires, swap them over, so the drive one and drive naught signals were then swapped, build a little adapter, put it all back together, and my EME-232, which is the model of drive, I think it might be a Sony unit, but it's the model of drive that was, I think, only fitted to that computer because it's a high-density one, and most of the other models took low-density um, uh, flippy disks. I adapted my EME-232 to make it drive B so that I could boot from my GoTech but still read floppy drives on the computer that I purchased from Mr. ZX Spectrom, good friend of mine on Twitter. And that's that tweet. <laughs> but that, did, that didn't fit in 280 characters. Why? Why did it? Why, why didn't you give up? What? What? What drove you to these links? Um, I I don't like giving up. I I felt like there should be a perfectly sensible solution to this problem, and I couldn't let it go until it was fixed. And it's like that with all the computers I have behind me. So just to go through, we have the Amstrad PCW, which is in excellent working order with a working daisy wheel printer there's some more pictures on twitter where the daisy wheel printer is a a big spinning disc with uh letters of the alphabet on little flexible arms around from a central hub they look like petals on a daisy hence daisy wheel and the printer spins the disc around until the letter you want is dead at the top and then it fires a hammer using a big electromagnet and it smacks the letter through the ink ribbon into the um, paper on the um, on the roll on this on the plan, just like a, a typewriter, uh, but instead of lots of levers, it's a spinny wheel. And what happens is the electromagnet fires this hammer arm with such force the arm snaps, and they're incredibly hard to find, and they're only used on this printer. But I managed to get a replacement. Um, I don't, when the when the arm is cracked, you don't get the force, so it, the print goes very dim. But that's so I have an Amstrad PCW. 9512, the best of the PCWs, with a working daisy wheel printer. I have uh, a BBC Micro, the computer I had when I was at school. I have um, what I think I now have come to realise is possibly the worst Apple Macintosh ever made. I have the Macintosh LC2. It is (laughs) unbelievably slow and just about everything in it was broken. I bought it from the from the same gentleman, actually, uh, Spencer, Mr. ZX Spectrum. He sold me the, the Macintosh as well. The capacitors had leaked all over the motherboard. The hard drive um, died. Inside the hard drive, there's a little rubber bump stop that stops the head of the disc falling off the end of the platter. So basically, it's on a little swing arm, and when it hits this bump stop, it just goes bump, and that stops the disc from damaging itself. The rubber disintegrates and goes sticky. So when your hard drive goes to sleep, it parks the head up against this rubber bump stop. And then when you file the hard drive on, it was sort of 50-50 as to whether the mechanism could unfree itself from this sticky, tarry mess that this rubber had dissolved into. So I had the hard drive apart. I know you're never supposed to take hard drives apart. And really, that is excellent advice. Do not take hard drives (laughs) apart. But I took this hard drive apart and replaced all the sticky goo with new bits of rubber. And the drive did at least work for... um, I think I got about four or five months out of it, which I don't think is too bad considering I I had a hard drive open. Um, But yeah, this machine is unbelievably slow and limited to uh, 10 megabytes of RAM, which is a really weird number. But that's got a a SCSI SD card replacement in it, and it mostly works except the monitor, I think, is on the way out and the audio doesn't work because I think there's some uh, capacitor goo under some of the circuits somewhere. I have a Gigatron, which I'm building, which is this computer that doesn't have a processor. It's made entirely out of 7.4 series logic chips. And my latest acquisition, oh, I have a Sega Genesis. It's a mega drive as far as I'm concerned, because I had one of those as a kid, and they're amazing. Best console ever made. And my latest acquisition is a Commodore 128, which was the replacement to the C64, and by any metric, it sold fairly well. They sold, I think, about four or five million of them, which is not I'm, not bad. Going. I've never heard of it before I saw it on your Twitter. Yeah, so it's the replacement for the C64. It contains 
an entire Commodore C64 inside it, CPU, video chip. Uh, it's got double the RAM. It contains a copy of the C64 um, boot ROM and basic ROM. So it's literally a copy of the Commodore 64. But then it has this other mode where you get a vastly better version of basic. Commodore 64 basic is atrocious. Making people write to memory addresses in order to put pixels on the screen is outrageous and shouldn't have been allowed. The Commodore 128's version of BASIC has commands like circle and play. So you tell it which notes to play and it plays them. It's so much better, but completely compatible with the old system. Uh, and for whatever reason, um, you can see some great videos with this featuring the designer, Bill Hurd, uh, on YouTube. He was on the 8-Bit Guy, amongst other things. Um, it contains a Z80, which is one of the reasons I love it. So it should run the same software as the Amstrad. It comes with a copy of CPM3. Um, yeah, and it's sort of this this three-in-one. It's a Commodore 128 with a much better version of BASIC. It's a CPM system, which uses a CGA monitor. So you do need two monitors to drive this thing because the Z80 half and the C64 half have different display outputs. Um, yeah, and a Commodore 64 all in one, and it comes with a built-in five and a quarter inch disk drive. So I bought it, uh, was able to collect it recently, and then immediately took it to pieces because, of course, um, it wasn't quite working correctly. It, I used it for about a day, I think, before I got the screwdriver out and, and disassembled it. So that that's awaiting some um, some new parts. There's a there's a cool thing you could do with a Raspberry Pi where you can get it to emulate a, a floppy drive. It's just the way that the Commodore is designed. You don't need to to go down to sort of the the level of the magnetic media. It's a there's a serial bus, so it's much easier to to insert stuff. Um, so yeah, so that that's going to get built up and reassembled. It's beautiful. Well, there are obviously more tweets, but there are not enough hours in the day. To, <laughs> it's it's so fascinating. Uh, I'm I'm really impressed. Uh, and I, 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 you know what? I don't want you neglecting your township when you're <laughs> rebuilding all this stuff. But the people of St. Ives also need need you. Yeah, I, it's, uh, it's it's hard to strike a balance, but yeah, no, the, the town does come first. People of St. Ives, you have go. my word on that. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much, Jonathan, um, and uh, thanks for being on here. I'm I'm stoked to. I mean, can I can I can I build a Neotron? Like, does that seem like something that someone like, you know, a person <laughs> that knows how to clone something on GitHub and order stuff online? Like, how far how far is that away? Uh, yeah. So the the PCB is is definitely do doable. As I said, I'm terrible at soldering, and I can do it. So it's it's all chunky through hole stuff with big fat legs and whatever. So Yes, you can get the PCB, you can order it, you can solder it up because I've done it. What's missing at the moment is the software. So at the moment, the software, I think, displays uh, a picture on screen, um, but the keyboard interface isn't working, and the printer port, the MIDI, the sound, the SD card, basically all the functionality I had on the Monotron needs porting over. So I know in theory it should all work, but there's a bunch of software stuff to do. And I wouldn't necessarily recommend you buy a Monotron because there's a design flaw in the PCB that means you have to solder the keyboard and mouse connectors underneath the circuit board. Because I read the schematics wrong, I read the footprints wrong, and I missed the note that said, uh, from underneath. So when I laid it out in KiCad, everything was mirror imaged because I was looking at the board the wrong side and you have to solder everything upside down. So. Yeah, I don't have anything that's in a in a good workable state, but yeah, keep an eye on my Twitter, keep an eye on my GitHub, because I do want to push this forward to the point where it's a kit that you can just buy and say, yes, I have built my own computer and I yeah. own a copy of a schematics and it's all under a license that allows me to to respin it and do what I want with it. That's beautiful. Yeah, so it's a the real JP Ster on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Um if people want to move to St. Ives, how do they <laughs> how do they apply for citizenship? Um, yeah, it's, we're, in a, we're in a beautiful part of uh, England, just on the edge of the fens. We're about fifteen miles uh, north west of uh, of Cambridge. Um, if you're if you're ever in the area, check out Cambridge because it's an amazing city 
with some fabulous history. And while you're at it, come up to St. Ives for the day because it's beautiful down here in the in the valley. Um, yes, yeah, we've got some great scenery around here. Wonderful. Well, I, de- I definitely got to swing by. Uh, yeah, thank you so much and, and have, a, have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you so much.